It's 2029. Why are we still talking about mutants? The movie takes place in the year 2029. I wanted us to land in a place where we could still see ourselves and the here and now, but maybe just a little worse or a little bigger or more exaggerated. James has created a world which is recognizable and familiar and everyday and in its way commonplace and yet wrapped in this maelstrom of fear and excitement and danger and the need to escape. There are no new mutants, understand? There's been a new one born in 25 years, not anywhere. Mutants are a dying breed, and that casts a whole new sense to the reality of the world that Logan now finds himself in. This movie doesn't have to pay service to these other films. It gives you an opportunity to really do something completely unique. But setting the movie in the near future is one of the biggest challenges for us because we didn't want to have all these gadgets and gizmos distracting us from the intimate story. So we've created a a very unique approach where we've stripped everything back. While the movie's taking place in the future, it almost kind of feels slightly retro in a way. The kind of cultural struggles we're having right now, the sense of disconnection, people living disconnected from one another, all of that we tried to kind of incorporate without going nuts and making the movie kind of a dystopian fantasy. We have automated trucks that are driving across country, which is actually probably only a heartbeat away. We also have automated threshers that are harvesting corn in Kansas. In the background of some shots, we have an automated street sweeper. I wanted it to be resembling our world. I remember 25 years ago, people would talk about what the future is going to be like. And here it is 25 years later, and New York essentially looks the same. You know, L.A. essentially looks the same. The cars change, fashion changes a little, the music we're listening to. It can either be the sad or most beautiful thing about humanity, but the truth is that we don't change that fast. <laughs> See, you're not the only one that's been in hands. Donald Pierce leads a group called the Reavers who are made up of a whole different bunch of amputees and different kinds of damaged guys with unique limbs, mechanical limbs, cyborg limbs built on. Donald has an extensive background in the military, so he's genetically engineering them, not just to get a robotic limb, but to have it that much more functional. I love the idea of this kind of hardcore, tough as nails bunch of amputee warriors, and that's what I wanted to retain and explore. This is a long way. You understand, I am not taking you to North Dakota. It was really important to Jim that we get off the stage and that we go to practical locations and shoot it in a way not a lot of movies get made anymore. Jim wanted real places. He wanted to use real environments and not have to go to a place and totally remodel it to make it look like a film crew came in here and scenic it up. John Matheson came on as our DP, who's absolutely terrific and was really into the idea of using a lot of practicals and available light and creating a very realistic, grounded look for the movie. There's not one glamorous, clean moment in this film. So, you know, everyone's grubby, dirty, bruised, cut. We can be rougher and truer and walk into a location where the light is unflattering or it's hard. It's middle of the day, hot, burning, shimmering desert and white skies, not blue skies. There's a few puffy clouds here and again, but it's uncomfortable. John's an incredibly talented guy. He's got a resume that anyone would be proud to have. And for all of us, I think we want to kind of get it to be more real, more in camera less digital, less artificial, in whatever ways we could do that. And we were lucky enough to get John to come and help us do that. It's like a road movie to me and very real. Closer to those road movies of the 70s. People on the run, got to move, got to run, got to get away. People in flight. <laughs> landscapes that we were able to incorporate really did impact the filmmaking. It informed the actors, it informed production design. We wanted to create this sense of a cross-country journey, heading northward from the El Paso area to the Dakotas. Jim, from the very beginning, wanted to get a lot of different looks from the dry desert, New Mexico and Texas and Oklahoma, into Kansas, up through South Dakota, North Dakota, and then ultimately the border of Canada. Francois and I actually had time to go out, poke around and see what was available and what was out there. And we would come back with locations and it would inspire Jim to change certain things in the script. With a movie of this size, it's virtually impossible to take 400 people on the road through America. So the real challenge was to try to figure out how to land in basically two states and try to get a big look. You're gonna start in El Paso terrain, which we use New Mexico for. Then you're gonna move slowly into kind of farmland 
which we use Southern Mississippi and Northern Louisiana for. We did our stage work in New Orleans. And then as you move into the Rockies, we actually return to the highlands of New Mexico, almost on the Colorado border. I think you will feel that you're seeing a real journey in a way that I don't think is quite the same as when we do it digitally. There is a bit of a color arc in the film in that it starts hot and dry and they kind of come up to this more green, verdant place. There are a lot of natural hues and natural tones that have been inspired by the colors of the Mexican desert and the colors of El Paso and going through Kansas and up to the border north. So we've been augmenting that with sort of some blues and warm golds and things, trying to create kind of a rich look. In most of these movies, you're under tremendous pressure to be bigger than the last one, to do something bigger, more fantastic in scope louder, more intense, and we, in a sense, withdrew from that entire challenge. So one of the biggest challenges for the production designer on this film was how do I build these sets, create these spaces, but do it in a way that it doesn't feel like just another one of these pictures. Our sets were built like they were really locations and they had hard ceilings and a lot of practical lighting, and then he would sort of augment that to create a very believable world. Francois's designs are not symmetrical or pretty. They are odd and unusual and real. You didn't know when you were in the studio. You didn't know when you were on the road. live in this sort of derelict smelting plant, as people inevitably do in comic book movies. No one's living in a nice little house in a cul-de-sac somewhere. They're living in an abandoned smelting plant. I don't even know what a smelting plant is. It's a bizarre set, but it's Charles's home. It's a grim and uncomfortable and unpleasant place when you can't blame them for wanting to get away from it. When I first started writing the script, I actually had them starting in Kentucky and Charles was being kept inside a bourbon tank. And then at some point, I moved it to the south of the border and that's when Francois and I started working on different looks. One of my favorite sets was the exterior of the smelting plant because it was a full build. Jim wanted to create a chase and a choreography all through the eight acre site. And so it was really creating a world from the ground up. Francois made a model of the smelting plant and of this water tower. I've got water towers and other films of mine, bridges and water towers I'm forever fascinated with. And then at some point in us talking about different arrangements of these buildings, it fell over and it suddenly looked like a spider with its legs kind of sticking like a dead insect or something lying on its side. There's actually a little water treatment plant or a power plant out there. It's a very little structure and we built around it, basically on top of it, and then added the various elements that we needed to kind of complete the environment. I personally, if I was living there, I would have had a good sweep. I'd have, I'd have got a broom, I'd have picked up some of the garbage, I'd have made it more of a home. If you are planning to blow your brains out, could you wait till you're out on the high seas? I just mop these floors. So we're standing outside the smelting plant, which is Logan's hideout. We're supposed to be somewhere in the desert in Chihuahua, Mexico, outside Juarez. And we searched for about uh, five months to find the right location to build this set. And we found it here about an hour outside Albuquerque near Rio Rancho. The set's made up of about five main structures that take up like 1.35 acres. It's quite a big set. There's Charles Tank that's a fallen water tower. Then we've got the main building, which is where the kitchen is and where our heroes hang out. And we've got Logan's bedroom and shower room that's been repurposed. And these uh, series of catwalks that are designed to appear like we're taking sort of ore out of the ground and then up into the main building for sort of processing. New deal, cranes moving down there. And what's wonderful here is you can look in 360 degrees and not see any signs of homes or habitation. So it's really a phenomenal location. When we started, it was squeaky clean, brand new when we moved in. So we went through over a period of about two months and started cladding the entire place to make it look like it had been forgotten and abandoned. Charles is kept in an old tank, which is rusted. You know, it's like a colander. It's got lots of holes in it, from rust holes. It also has that feeling of the universe and the stars and the knees connected with everything. The reason I kept gravitating toward a tank was I wanted something that still had some echo of Cerebro and also the idea that you were trying to somehow insulate or contain the power of his brain in some kind of reflective material that would reduce how many people he could hurt if he had an attack. You're waiting for me to die. It's sort of a bittersweet end to him where his happy days and his most powerful time in the previous films was in this spherical structure at the X-Mansion. This is where we're hiding out. 
One of the first stops on the journey is a casino. In Louisiana, most of the casinos are water-based paddle boats. So we actually went to the only land-based casino in town, and it was great for us because it did give us a big Vegas feel without having to go to Las Vegas. That scene was really difficult for a kind of bizarre reason, which is that even a movie shoot, anyone under 18 could not set foot in the casino. Specifically in the Louisiana area, you're just not allowed to have a minor anywhere near the interior of the casino. We had to do a little bit of trickery. We had to use doubles. We did some visual effects work to kind of communicate it, and we created sets where we could double the environment. So between all three of those or four of those little cheats, we were able to pull it off. It's a pretty elaborate special effect effect scene that hopefully does not look like a special effect scene at all, just so we could walk her from the entrance to the elevator. <laughs> Charles's ability to stop everyone in place and freeze everyone in place is really interesting. In this movie, that's the power that has gone out of control, because when he is not medicated, he is liable to have seizures which can impact other people, even if they're not even in the same room or the same building with him, and that makes him very dangerous. The idea is that he's actually stopped everyone from breathing. So they're not only frozen, but they're actually drowning. And that led me to imagining what kind of action sequence could I have? And something that seemed really chilly would be the idea of Logan entering a sequence where everyone's frozen and him picking out every bad guy and essentially gutting them while they can't even move anything but their eyeballs. The look was really interesting. There's a lot of technology now where if someone is too bumpy with their camera, you can run it through a program that steadies it. So we did tests before we shot when we were crazy with the camera, like crazy shaking. It. And then we ran it through these programs. And of course, once the camera is shaking that much, it can't ever really bring it down. But you get all this beautiful smearing as the computer is trying to kind of pull together an image from something that's so chaotic. So the whole sequence is actually shot with the cameraman on a kind of vibrating rope, vibrating the camera like crazy. And then we run it through a process which takes all the shake out, but you are left with this kind of smearing effect. We should help them. No, we have to keep going. Someone will come along. Someone has to come along. One thing that happens when you're writing the road pictures, you have characters who just arrive. You just land and you meet them, and they're not here for the whole movie. They're here just to kind of play a role. And the Munson family is a family that at a kind of midpoint in the movie, in a kind of moment of repose, a moment of rest, our heroes have a chance to kind of gather themselves after their last kind of brush with the Reavers. The farm scenes represented the heart of the movie. It was really important that that feel very, very real. We were lucky enough to find an amazing farmhouse in northern Louisiana, which is the only spot in the entire state where they produce corn at a great quantity. So the farmhouse was surrounded by acres and acres of corn in all directions, and it happened to be this incredible house that was built in the 1830s that hadn't really been modified, and then we recreated the interior on stage. The family environment, the place that Logan has not been to, whether it's been years, decades, whatever, it's a place he's not comfortable in. It's a place Charles has been yearning for, and it's the first time that our young actress has ever seen a family dinner, ever seen family photos, mementos, a place of that environment. It's a scene of such warmth and mutual affection and understanding and good humor and good food in a domestic environment, which is not something that you have seen much in this franchise. You know, Logan, this is what life looks like. A home, people who love each other, safe place. You should take a moment and feel it. When the Munsons die, for no better reason than our heroes have sadly stopped there to rest, it launches a kind of very dark movement of the film in which Logan and Laura are traveling together. You're trying as a screenwriter to kind of lift an audience up and then however cruel it sounds, drop them as hard as you can. So what we're trying to do is to kind of allow Logan this glimpse of life and then to rip it. In a sense, proving Logan right. It's like, no, the world, that is not for me and will never be for me. Get that, uh, our own kid out. Get 
gotta be fucking kidding me. The idea of Eden is actually three parts. First, it's this image that appears in a comic book as a fantastical sort of creation from a comic book artist. And it turns out that does not exist. It's just a bunch of dusty rocks with an old abandoned ranger station sitting on top of the mesa. That was the second part that had to be sort of designed. What's in the comic book looks grander and more splendiferous and designed, but there is a sanctuary for these children. We want it as minimal as possible, meaning you have this duality of the kind of fantasy one and reality one. Where the mutant kids are waiting is outside of Abiquiu, where Georgia O'Keeffe painted and famously lived. And it's this very unique and distinctive landscape. And Francois built these two structures there. He built the watchtower, which is kind of mimicking a uh, fire ranger station, and the bunkhouse. I love the ranger tower. It's got all this promise. It's got all this hope, that sense of scope and scale, all the windows. You feel like they're perched, ready to take that final step across the border. So I know Francois had a great time with that. And the art department in general had a great time dressing those environments. We had to create a little environment that is believable that for the first time in their lives, these kids are free. For the first time, they're at a campfire, out in the stars, working together. They've had to take these skills that they learned as mercenaries and bring them together. You see the woods? See. It's an eight-mile hike through there. You see that pass? That's where we will be safe. The third part of Eden is these woods where our heroes sort of end up on the very border with freedom on the other side of the cliffs. For that, we had to find very sort of impressive and awesome visual of gigantic cliffs that had to be traversed. And we're really lucky to find them here at Brazos Cliffs in northern New Mexico, where we're flanked with 1,200-foot Precambrian cliffs that are really impressive on, on one side of the set, and then some really beautiful forests on the other. We wanted to expand the feel of the film and give it some larger scope. Brazos Cliffs gives us an architectural element and something to focus on in the background. It gave us a really wonderful, flexible space to create sort of the final showdown where we get to see Logan and his last stand. I'm hoping that when people see this movie, they're gonna be really surprised at how refreshing and sort of new it is. Using real locations whenever we could, real vehicles, real driving. There's a certain reality when someone's riding in a car, the way the wind's blowing on them, the way the light's changing around them, and even the performance. The world is really going by. They're not sitting in a green void watching nothing or watching a guy eating a tuna sandwich from the crafties. That's a lot of what we're after, the production designer, the DP and I, in trying to get a very naturalistic film.